Bueno, bueno, aló, 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 aló. Bueno, muy buenas tardes ya, ya son las 12 y 37. Eh, vamos a dar inicio, continuamos con nuestra agenda académica hoy acá en la Casa de la Cerveza, en, el, en, el, en la sección, en el área de desarrollo web y móvil que tenemos hoy acá en, en la Casa de la Cerveza. Hoy hemos pasado por diferentes tópicos, pero todos muy relacionados. Estamos en Internet of Things, que finalmente el Internet of Things genera mucho, mucha data, que va por Big Data. Hemos pasado por Cloud, por temas muy técnicos de arquitectura Cloud, como lo fue José Papo. Y ahora volvemos nuevamente al, 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 con la línea del Internet of Things, eh, contando un poco con las experiencias y y pues como el trabajo que viene haciendo Adriana Lerasi en, en Canadá. Les cuento un poco de ella. Adriana construye y diseña ofrece talleres prácticos que permiten a los equipos construir prototipos... Ay, se me queda apagado esto. <ríe> prototipos de trabajo en una sesión estructurada utilizando hardware, software y electrónica para explotación de internet. Pero bueno, básicamente Adriana eh, viene de Canadá. Adriana viene, trabaja en un laboratorio en la, en la Universidad de, en la Universidad de Canadá. Me corriges luego el nombre de la universidad. Eh, y eh, viene trabajando con temas de body hacking, trabajando con eh, temas de makey makey, que si los que estuvieron esta mañana, y pude, o si ahorita pueden ver makey makey, búsquenlo en YouTube y miren los videos, es una cosa impresionante de poder conectar eh, un banano frutas para armar un control remoto o para armar un piano. Cosas de ese estilo son las que está, las que está trabajando Adriana de, en, en su laboratorio en Canadá. Así que, ah, bueno, antes también recuerdo agradecimientos a todos los patrocinadores, a Bogodep que está organizando este espacio al tiempo por difusión ETV que ha puesto digamos internet y a muchas cosas como el Mintic que digamos esta iniciativa ha sido posible y de hecho ha sido muy interesante poder bajarlo y estar cerca aquí a la, a la zona T para poder estar más cercana con la gente en el Colombia 3.0 eh, una última cosa, recuerden nuestro hashtag es Col30, Col30 Web eh, o Colombia 3.0, el 3 en número y el 0 en número, eh, para que nos sigan, o arroba Bogodep para que nos sigan, comenten, tomen fotos y sean sociales. Por favor, un aplauso muy fuerte para Adriana Lerasi. Adriana, thanks for coming. Thank you very much. So I'm very sorry, I am going to present in English. I can see at least one person on the, um, on the translator device. Are you going to wear yours? Just please wave your hands if I'm going too fast, okay? If you miss something, wave your hands, okay? Great, well, um, thank you very much to Elkin for having me here. It's quite an honor to be presenting at uh, Columbia 3.0. We actually have a similar conference in Canada called Canada 3.0, and it's also about the digital future of our country as well. Um, I'm from Toronto. Um, I'm the founder of a small company called Conveyor Built. I'm also the co-founder of the Get Your Bot On Robotics Hackathon. So I have a few projects underway that I'm going to talk about today. But I'm going to start with my own personal definition of uh, what the Internet of Things is. And I, I don't think you'll, uh, there'll be too many people that would disagree, at least with this most basic definition. Uh, for me, the Internet of Things is sensors and or device, devices or sensors connected to devices uh, with communications and networks. And all of those come together um, uh, to create the Internet of Things. You've probably already seen solutions in the Internet of Things. You really have to talk right into this. Get better, otherwise, just a little bit. Is that better? Okay, that's much better. Okay. Okay, so you've probably already seen um, Internet of Things devices. There are lots of uh, health based Internet of Things devices, heart rate monitors, um, um, uh, temperature monitors that you can attach to your body. Um, there are uh, lighter and temperature sensors for your home. There's a whole field of home automation that, um, that there are new sensors coming out. At the communications level, there are all kinds of devices. Um, if you are a fan of Kickstarter, or Indiegogo, or some of these crowdfunding platforms, you'll probably see devices such as the uh, Flutter or the shrink down, Shrunk Down Arduino or the um, Bladeduino or Babduino or perhaps not even an Arduino platform device that incorporates communications with uh, microcontrollers so that Internet of Things products are easier to make. 
Uh, then there's the network layer. And so companies like Cisco are creating infrastructure products to manage the data on the network and all of these connected devices. But then there's also sort of the social networks of uh, Internet of Things devices, networks such as Sense or Carlos this morning met, mentioned Zively, which used to be Patch Bay. There are also uh, similar networks for robotics. There's one in, in it's a Canadian-based company called My Robots, which is sort of the Facebook for robots. And all of those networks allow your devices to publish their information to the web. They give you visualizations, dashboards of that information, and allow you to do different things with it, and also create interactivity between devices. So it's quite an exciting field, and there's lots of grassroots and, and um, DIY things happening in the Internet of Things that are very exciting. Uh, I mentioned some quick examples, just to reiterate the whole quantified self movement is often um, um, based on Internet of Things types of devices, uh, the heart rate monitors that I mentioned. Do they have a uh, quantified self meetup group here in Bogota? We have one in Toronto, and it's a, it's a community of people that are doing, um, some of them actually hacking devices and using them and pu publishing their personal information about their sleep habits, about their heart rate, about their temperature, um, and then sharing that information with each other and self-experimenting, basically. It's very, very interesting. Um, there's environmental monitoring, like the AirBot and the WaterBot, and then these devices are also being used in citizen science applications. So um, communities of people are gathering the data locally and sharing it. So you, if you live in Toronto, could see what the air quality is like in LA if you're heading out there. Um, and it's a very interesting sort of movement of sharing of information and data and collection of that information and data by the, by the average citizen. Energy usage, there's uh, the whole smart meter movement, which is very common in Ontario. Uh, Nick actually tells me that we are 100% smart meter enabled in Ontario. Um, 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 and that has its own implications for collection of that data and sharing of that information. Um, but also uh, some of the um, in-home devices like Kilowatt, which allows you, you plug it into your outlet and then plug a device into it, and you can monitor the energy usage of any given device. So a lot of con sort of consumer-based, direct-to-consumer devices that are available now um, with functionality that wasn't previously available. Um, one of my favorite uh, is actually a product by my partner in the robotics hackathon, Nick Stedman and his team, Steady Robots, and this is the Modi. The Modi is actually a servo motor with Arduino and Bluetooth communications on top of it that you can control from your smartphone or web application. And so it's making the uh, programming of robotics very easy, uh, both for education but also for professional applications, and this is a turntable or a DJ's uh, um, uh, scratch turntable that they made. It's a demo on their site you can check out. So some of the challenges with Internet of Things um, uh, that people are grappling with, uh, the fact that user behavior is unpredictable. Um, you, you may create a device for a particular intention to gather particular information, but you don't really know how the end user is going to use that information because it's a whole, it's a whole new field. Uh, at this point. Um, there are massive amounts of data, and we've been hearing about cloud data and big data today, um, but massive amounts of data, what do you do with that data, where does that information get stored, um, and then how do you use it effectively, how do you visualize it, um, how do you create features and functionality with that data. Uh, usability affects traction, if people can't if you have a network connected device and they can't connect it to the network, it's relatively useless. And you have to remember that a lot of these devices don't have screens on them. So how do you create usable devices? Privacy and security, once you start gathering all of this information, um, you really need to think about where that data is going, who has access to it. Uh, a couple of years ago, there was a whole um, Fitbit um, um, issue where uh, Fitbit by default was publishing all of your information on your profile and there was particular information about your intimate life that was getting broadcast to whoever was reading your profile and it was rather embarrassing. So, um, so thinking about privacy and security, in Ontario we actually have a, a privacy commissioner. Uh, I'm from Toronto and Toronto is in the province of Ontario in Canada. 
and um, we have a privacy commissioner and she's uh, pushing a lot this idea of privacy by design. So designing with privacy and security in mind from the outset. Um, and it's quite a powerful uh, concept. Um, and then finally, who owns that data? It's your personal data, but who owns it? Who gets to use it? Who gets to see it? Who gets to capitalize it on, on it commercially? Carlos talked about our social network information. There's a lot of information about us out there. Um, you know, we, we're tweeting right now, so now everybody knows where I am. Who really has the right to that information? And, and I think those, these are all important issues that if you're designing Internet of Things, you need to be thinking of. And so um, there are a number of trends that are making Internet of Things devices more popular and more common in, in fairly recent times. Um, there's lots of prototype-ready technology. So um, if you are familiar with Arduino, if you are familiar with some of the other open source hardware platforms, those platforms are getting very easy to use. There are communities that support them. They share information about how those platforms work but what they've made with those tools and technologies, they share tutorials around them, and so that you can pick up a board, and if you have an idea, you could probably, between a few makers, find out exactly how to make your idea, because they've published their information. Um, and then the ones that are open source, you can then take to um, manufacture, and because if they've been open sourced down to their, um, their parts level, you can actually refactor them and create them in the form factor that you need. Um, Access to fabrication is becoming uh, easier and easier. There's um, print shops now that are offering 3D printing. Um, in, in Toronto, actually, one of the office supply stores sells 3D printers, which is pretty amazing. It's consumer-based product now, which is quite amazing. Um, there are, there are companies that you can send your 3D designs to and they'll send you back your 3D printed part if you need a physical uh, um, uh, enclosure. There's also maker spaces and hack spaces that give you access to the tools and technology that you might not have at home. If you don't have a CNC mill or machine, if you don't have a soldering workstation, there are hacker spaces where perhaps you can buy a membership and access this kind of technology very easily. And then finally, there's the whole community around. Uh, the, the DIY movement and the maker movement that's sharing information and crowdsourcing solutions so that you can find the information you need to build your product. So if you're a, an independent maker today, there are lots of things out there for you that can make innovation, innovating in this space very, very easy. I already talked about some of the things that are making, that are bringing down the cost of entry. Um, uh, Crowdsourced ideation and validation. If you have an idea um, and you have a first prototype and you're using a crowdfunding platform, that's a very good way to test your market and see if people will actually buy it. There are other platforms that actually let you pull your, your target market and ask them if your product makes sense and if they would buy it before you even put out a, a crowdfunding campaign. Um, we talked about the open sourced IP for collaborative development. One of the things that was my job when I uh, was executive director at the Knowledge Media Design Institute was uh, building academic court corporate partnerships. And in Canada, there are lots of programs that are getting very friendly, even for startups. So even if you're a small company with not a lot of financial resources, you can access funding so that you can work with an academic to do your product development. And that's very exciting. And finally, the viability of niche products. So if you have a product that has a very, very small market, it's getting easier and easier to reach that market, even if it's dispersed um, geographically. So um, being able to access uh, niche markets is, is very uh, easy now. And so even products that have a very small um, financial viability still could be made. All of these are leading to accelerated innovation. Now at uh, the Think Tank Lab, which was a lab that we opened when I was at uh, Knowledge Media Design Institute, we had a motto and it was that you had to roll up your sleeves and make something if you came to the lab. The lab was a maker space and I, I'm not sure um, how strong the maker movement is here in Colombia or, or how common maker spaces are, but there are quite a number of them in North America. Um, in Toronto alone, we've got Hack Lab, we've got Site3, which are, are uh, 
two different maker spaces. Um, and there are various incubators as well that offer facilities for people who, who make things. Um, there are also membership-based workshops and, and resources. There's a, uh, a large workshop in the States or a franchise in the States called Tech Shop where you can buy a membership and access fairly professional quality um, uh, tools and equipment um, on a monthly membership fee basis to make your, your products. And they also offer uh, workshops to teach you how to use them. The libraries are also getting into the makerspace. Um, they're starting to understand that part of understanding information and, and culture is understanding the making of that information and culture. And so uh, there's a whole movement in the library sciences of makerspaces and hackerspaces within libraries. In, in you know, all over the world, there are meetups, um, but there's quite a strong community of meetups around making and makerspaces and DIY and hacking that you can join. And finally, there are the hackathons, like our robotics hackathon. Uh, there was the Space Apps Challenge, which uh, was an international hackathon that happened in April. And I know that Bogota actually had uh, a group uh, working on that as well. As I mentioned, uh, Think Tank Lab, uh, we opened that um, uh, a few years ago. I think we opened in late 2009. Um, so we were fairly early on the makerspace um, scene in Toronto. And the, the theory behind Think Tank was to create a collaboration space where small and medium-sized businesses and companies could collaborate around the Internet of Things. We have a very strong digital media community in Toronto, but not a lot of companies that understand hardware or uh, interaction with hardware um, and the Internet of Things. And so we thought if we could create a space where collaboration could happen, knowledge sharing could happen, that the companies themselves, if they interacted with our students that were working on some of these ideas, and there was some knowledge transfer that these companies would innovate their own products and services. Um, we, we position Think Tank as a pre-commercialization platform. Um, so we, didn't, we did not incubate companies, we incubated ideas. So if you had an idea or a concept, you could use the space, or if you had an idea, you could use the space to develop it to the stage of concept. And there's been a lot of talk about that in the transmedia space, but getting from you know, a very, very early stage um, idea to a first prototype is not an easy thing when you're talking about hardware that you've never worked with before. So we, we worked with companies doing that. It was a public-private partnership, so it was funded by our provincial government, and it had a consortium of companies behind it um, that, that also provided services and, and uh, in-kind and time and expertise to the lab. And in it, we run workshops, roundtables, um, discussions, and knowledge sharing, and that, and that continues now, and I'll talk a little bit about the types of things that we did. So perhaps most importantly, there was access to tools, and that was the, the most fun. And in fact, my reintroduction, I, I do have an engineering background, and I hadn't really worked as a mechanical or electrical engineer ever. I had always worked in information technology and business process, and so this was really a reintroduction for me. And the reality is the technology itself perhaps hasn't changed much, but the tools have become so much easier to use that now you can get up and running fairly quickly. And so in our lab, we had a 3D printer, and I learned to create 3D models again that I had learned many years ago when I was back in school. Um, we had a laser cutter. You can be up and running and know how to run a laser cutter if you know how to use um, uh, basic graphics programs. You can do that in five minutes. And you could be cutting your products out in, within five minutes. It's very, very easy to use. The CNC mill, a little bit more difficult. And it's also some of the ones that we had were very early. Um, uh, put, put, them, put them together yourselves types of CNC mills. So they were a little bit more difficult to get running. But, uh, but we had some of those as well. And then we had soldering workstations. Uh, we have um, uh, various microcontroller uh, uh, products that people can, can use and try. Our workshops and roundtables are really where the activity happens, and those continue today. Um, we ran, very early on, we ran a workshop uh, where we taught people how to uh, sense light conditions and tweet those out to the internet. And it was really amazing because none of the people in the group had ever worked with a microcontroller before. And one in particular, um, uh, a woman named Judy, she's got a, a small company that, that 
broadcast digital children's content on the web. And when she left that, that workshop, she had all kinds of ideas about the types of products and merchandising she could do, given this new technology that was so easy to use and play with. She does have designers and creative people, but she had no one on her team to show her how, e how easy it was to build hardware and to build new hardware products. And so one of the key, um, the key focus of the uh, of the Think Tank Lab was this kind of opportunity for people to be exposed and then to come up with their own ideas of what they wanted to build. We did workshops in wearables. You talked about botanic halls, and I believe one of the inventors actually ran our wearables workshop. She's a professor at our local university, yes. Very cool. Um, we did workshops in 3D printing and digital fabrication. People walked out with something that they had printed, which was always, it's always very exciting when people can walk away with something they've made. Um, and then we did introductions to augmented reality. Um, the, our DIY prosthetics workshop is part of that series. Uh, and, and we've done workshops and continue to do workshops on things like bioplastics as well. So always with a very a, a physical making focus in mind. In addition, our, our informational sessions. So um, if you're talking about Internet of Things, you've got hardware, you've got software, you've got communications. It's very complex to create your products. And it's also a very complex intellectual property landscape. Um, it covers multiple aspects of intellectual property. And so we ran workshops on intellectual property for the Internet of Things. We ran workshops on funding your Internet of Things products. Um, we have various funding programs focused at uh, small and medium-sized corporations in Canada. And so we invited the people who run those programs to come and talk about how you could access them. Um, and, then, and then we did field trips, which was a lot of fun. Um, we would visit local making facilities or prototyping facilities or small-scale manufacturers in the area so people could see what kinds of um, uh, capacity there was locally. We, do, we did have um, a manufacturing capacity in Ontario. Um, it, it's been suffering a little bit, perhaps quite a bit, in, in more recent times. But certainly um, the maker revolution has as, as been talked about quite a bit is an opportunity for them to uh, perhaps be revitalized. So, um, so we tried to support that too. Our consortium had four academic partners. Uh, we had at least 14 startups and small firms. When we started, we have even more now. Uh, we, had an, we have an artist collective uh, that kept the lab open um, for open labs so people, anybody could access it. Even our local film festival is part of the uh, consortium. And there are projects that continue now, collaborations uh, that continue now within the lab um, around product, different product development. So, uh, it's quite an active community. And our DIY prosthetics workshop uh, actually came out of some of the work that we were doing at the lab. Um, that workshop, it, which is going to be what I'm going to talk about for much of the rest of the, the discussion, is really about exploring the idea of body hacking and, um, um, and prosthetics and the idea of, in, of embedded sensors and, and technologies, but exploring them in a manner that allows you to think about some of the socio-technical issues around them. Uh, for example, uh, issues of access, issues of rights, issues of information and privacy and security. So they're, they really, uh, those workshops, an interdisciplinary discussion. They include always a design and build a session. Um, and we, we always have a bit of a design exercise in there. Um, we've developed that with uh, Semaphore Lab, I, which I mentioned before, and within Think Tank Lab. The Semaphore Lab is actually a lab uh, focused on mobile and pervasive computing for accessibility. And that's part of the University of Toronto. My collaborator on that project, Nina Zagedli, who I'm going to talk about some of her work in a second, um, uh, really brought together some of the conceptual discussion and also um, some of her uh, partners and collaborators at the Banff New Media Center and at Hexagram Concordia uh, hosted our workshop, we, some of them which, of which we did simulcast. Uh, earlier this year, we were at the Festival de la Imagen in Manizales, uh, and that's how we've, we've connected with uh, some people in Colombia. So we've really, uh, the workshop has, has really sort of become quite, quite an interesting uh, place for also um, cross-cultural conversations as well about prosthetics. 
Uh, here are some pictures of what actually happens at our workshop. Um, uh, up here, uh, that's Shannon Bell, who's a political scientist, actually, and, and talks a lot about images of the body. She's also an artist and does some very controversial work around hacking of the, the female body. And, and um, so she spoke at one of our sessions. Uh, and beside her is Roberta Buyani, who runs the Art Sci Salon, which is a discussion group that talks about the intersection of art and technology. Um, so, so we have artists, we have academics. Uh, to the right, uh, we have um, two technologists. That's Eric Boyd, uh, who is part of the Quantified Self Movement and one of the founders of Hack Lab and is also um, organizing our Maker Fair in, in Toronto, uh, one of the, the leads in the organizing of the Maker Fair in Toronto. And on the other side, Alan, who um, has been doing lots of work around home automation. Um, and for them, the workshop, they got very excited about the low-tech part, which is the mold making. Uh, Valentin in the middle is a, is a very talented sculptor, and he walked them through mold making using alginate. And so what's very interesting is people who primarily work in the digital and with the hardware get very excited about some of the craft and the low-tech stuff that we're doing um, because it's not something they normally have access to, and they didn't realize how easy it was to make a mold and to cast a mold of your own hand. So we've had a lot of fun with that. Um, we've had university administrators. Suzanne has done a lot of work with universities in Toronto. Um, and she had never worked with electronics before. And there she is building something that was very exciting. Um, and then uh, Dolores as well, who's also a university administrator and an artist. So we've quite a, a diverse community that comes into our workshops. And this is just what one of the teams made. It was a glove that could sense, do a little bit of position sensing and would give you some visual feedback with a, with a light and some sound about what position your hand was in at any given time. Um, uh, mostly uh, the, by the techie team, that's Roberta laughing her head off in the back there um, about what she built. So, so being able to build something on an interdisciplinary team really uh, is very exciting for people and they enjoy it. So. So a little bit about collaborative making. Um, so different from perhaps an agile process or a typical design process, where the collaboration happens at the end as feedback, in a collaborative making process, you're really collaborating and, and, and the interdisciplinary discussion is happening throughout the design and build process. And because of that, the materials that you use are very important. All of our kits, we always provide a kit for our workshop. It includes the electronic parts, but it also includes craft parts because we want everybody at every skill set to be participating in the making session. Um, and the interdisciplinarity of the team helps to explore the issues and the challenges that you're discussing. For example, if you're talking about embedded sensors in a prosthetic, um, as a technologist, you might think, great, I want lots of data. Put all the sensors you can. Uh, but if you're a social scientist and you're thinking about the person's uh, autonomy, their image of their self, uh, perhaps who has access to that data, then you're going to raise issues of privacy and security. And I, and I think that's very interesting and powerful to have those kinds of discussions. And we very much um, try to have an iterative design process in the session. We try to get people to at least go through two full iterations of their design, although we don't always have time for that. Uh, one interesting thing um, earlier this week in the transmedia space is, I think, talking about this sort of collaborative making happens and is very obvious in art practices, uh, not necessarily so much in a, uh, an engineering practice. And coming from an engineering background, this was really quite a revelation to me, to be, to be able to treat the entire making process as a collaboration, even, even when you're making something technical. Uh, a large part of what we do is prototyping. Um, and again, here, there was a bit of a, a revelation for me from an engineering perspective that we don't just prototype to test functionality or features, that we also prototype to test design ideas and, and to explore the context within which our devices are going to be used. So in, a, in, in, a, in short, your prototype is a representation of your idea or your concept. Um, and it's a test of the particular aspect of the idea that you're trying to explore. And prototypes are meant to communicate the designer's intent. But most importantly, that the context is part of the prototype. 
And so we've been working on different design tools that in a very condensed period of time can take that into account. Our collaborative making workshops have a very, very specific uh, model and structure that we follow. Um, we use a critical making framework, which I'm going to talk about in a minute. Um, uh, there's always conceptual discussion. Um, we pay very close attention to the environment and the tools that, that we use. Um, we've developed a bit of a tool called the design narrative, uh, which is sort of a takeoff from other collaborative design, participatory design processes. Um, we really try to push participants out of their comfort zone. We often have people coming to the workshop saying, I'm not a technology person, I don't know anything about electronics, I just want to come for the discussion. And we very much stress that everybody can, can participate in that part of the discussion. And then we really stress interdisciplinarity and we do some work in, in the beginning of the workshop and prior to the workshop to, see, to try to structure teams so that they're very interdisciplinary. Just briefly, um, critical making uh, comes from the work of Matt Ratto, who's the professor at Semaphore Lab, um, the director of the, that lab, and the director of Think Tank Lab. Um, and all of his work is really focused on the fact that material making um, in, in a structured uh, process closely linked with conceptual exploration can lead to novel insights uh, uh, by the maker. He runs a critical making workshop within the university where essentially information science students who are largely from a humanities background make technical objects and explore theory and policy issues with them. Um, and that, that class is, is very, very popular within the university or within, within the faculty. Our critical making exercises have a very uh, specific structure of sort of three elements, prompts, publics and parts. We just presented this at the IEEE conference on uh, information and society and it was quite well received as a, as a paper so we're rather excited about that. Um, and so the prompts are the things that we ask people to discuss, the, dis the conceptual discussion that we have, the things we share with them to guide that discussion. The publics are some of the um, uh, the tools and the artifacts that we've created that we release open source that anybody could really pick up and, and work with, our guides, the code that we use. We always create a code base that people can just plug and play so that if they don't know anything about coding, they're not lost. Um, the, um, the, the circuit diagrams and all of the, the educational elements of how to build the object that we release, that's the publics. And finally, the parts, the actual kit, which also is, our list is, is certainly uh, released to the community. So if you're interested, I can point you to those resources. Um, I mentioned the, the conceptual discussion, um, the one for hacking the body and uh, the DIY prosthetics really came from Nina's work in this uh, splice project that she worked on. Um, if, you, if you have a chance, go to it, it's actually quite exciting. Um, she's, she's worked as a curator collecting anatomy drawings um, that were developed in the, in the 50s, as I understand, by a group of women that uh, contributed to the Grey's, Grey's Anatomy. And it was a very important anatomy book in North America and really educated generations of, of medical uh, doctors. Um, but these drawings were made by women in the biomedical communications program at the University of Toronto. Um, and they're, they're just beautiful drawings, just very, very detailed drawings. And she talks about and, and puts them in a context of sort of the role of women in in um, uh, medical communications and so um, and and she also looks at images of the body and hacking the body within that the context of that exhibit it's currently actually being mounted at the Pratt in New York so if you get a chance to go to New York you might want to check it out I mentioned uh, environment and tools um, What's really amazing to me is you put some colorful uh, modeling clay or markers in front of people and they get very excited um, and get very creative with it as well. And so we try to uh, keep the, the kit not um, accessible so that it's not intimidating and we make sure that there's something for everyone that wants to build something within the kit. I talked a little bit about the design narrative and this is the, the framework that we use. Um, 
this is very DIY uh, uh, image of it, but basically we walk people through talking about the context. So tell us a little bit about the opening scene. Who is the user? What's the context within which they'll be using the object? How will they use the, use the object? What are the circumstances within which they live? Um, we, t we ask them to discuss as a team the challenge that they're trying to address with their object. Um, what are the goals and desires of the user? Um, uh, what is the, the conflict that the user is trying to uh, um, allay with, with the product? And then we talk about how they're going to use your product and the success that they'll have with it. Um, so what are the measures of success? What's the solution? And then finally, the reflection part, which is really the most important part for us. And this is where the values uh, come in, uh, the social values that come in to, to the design process. So what is, what is really the moral of the story? So if you're a storyteller, if you come from transmedia, you know this framework very well. And I talked about uh, social values versus functional needs, but these are the things that we ask, ask, ask people to uh, reflect on. So when you're talking about prosthetics, you may be talking about issues of autonomy. How does the person um, um, live autonomously uh, even though they, they need something like a prosthetic? What about freedom? What about personal dignity? What about their own personal health? Uh, what about fairness and access to that object? And those are contrasted with the functional needs. What are the actual features of that object? How about, is it visible, is it not visible? Uh, how does it attach? What are the physiological uh, connections of that object? Uh, what does it look like? And then very technically, the privacy and security features and functions. So I think that's sort of gives you in a nutshell some of the structure around the workshop that we run. Um, we are running a workshop later this afternoon and I don't know that we'll have time to cover all of those elements of our regular workshop, but I do want to share some of the, the structure of it and so we'll go through a design exercise uh, later today. But as Conveyor Built, we have a, a few things that we're working on that are related to this. Uh, sort of in keeping with the structure of the workshop and the DIY prosthetics workshop, we do uh, a lot of times within academic settings, we do that uh, pro bono, but um, I also do similar workshops for the private sector and for organizations that are looking for a little bit of help with their design or their interaction design processes um, for innovation skills development. The Conference Board of Canada, which is a think tank in Canada, uh, released um, a white paper on innovation skills uh, within the organization. And within that, they talk about things like, are your people creative problem solvers? Do they understand how to uh, continuously approve products and services? Um, what about their skills in risk assessment? Um, what about their skills in relationship building and communications? And what about their implementation skills? And so our workshop could be tailored uh, to do those kinds of things as well. And in every workshop, we want people to build something. Um, we ran one for the, school, the Schulich School of Business, which is a business school at one of the universities in Toronto. And they were already working on an EEG product that, um, that, they, were build, that they were trying to uh, brainstorm particular applications for. And so I just brought some you know, uh, electrical tape, some LEDs, and some batteries. And they started to explore and brainstorm peripherals that they could, in fact, add to their EEG device. And it was really interesting, because out of all the groups that we've worked on, it was this business group that came up with the most interesting narratives about what they wanted to do with their product. They, they really, I get, because I went in at the end of the class, understood the whole narrative process and understood uh, uh, building the context around their product was really important when it came to these types of ideas. This was a team uh, at one of the universities as well. We did a Makey Makey workshop, and they're building a body instrument, basically. So they're using uh, contact swishes uh, on the body so that you could incorporate movement and control a, a, a piano that would work off the computer. So um, they had a lot of fun with that. The Get Your Bot On Robotics Hackathon that I mentioned before uh, was also a collaborative making exercise. Um, about just over 50 people uh, spent a weekend making robots. Many of them didn't know each other, so they were put into teams with strangers. 
Um, we gave them a kit which had a microcontroller and some different craft parts and wheels and stuff and just told them, make whatever you want. Um, but you have to show us something on Sunday and it has to move and it has to use the microcontroller. And it was pretty amazing some of the ideas that they came up with just because of the, the diversity of people. We set up a workshop with a drill press and a bandsaw for them, so they had tools that they perhaps never had access to before. Um, and we had uh, mentors that came. We had, I think, almost 10 mentors throughout the weekend, spending hours with teams trying to help them solve problems with the technology. Uh, one thing that was actually really amazing is when you put a bunch of people together in, in a sort of environment like this, we didn't offer amazing prizes. I think it was something silly like $300 for the whole team. Uh, and we had three categories, innovation, design, and technology. And we didn't even really define those very specifically. Um, but the collaboration that was happening, we had purchased a Bluetooth um, uh, 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 peripheral for, for the microcontroller. And Unfortunately, it wasn't compatible with the microcontroller that we bought, and we didn't realize it. So we had about four teams trying to use it, and each one would sort of make an advancement on hacking it to make it work. And they'd teach the other teams, and then another team would leapfrog them and then teach the, the rest of the teams. So it was really quite a collaboration between four different teams of getting that silly thing to work. And they did get it to work within a, you know, just a few hours, actually, which was amazing. Our last project that, that we're working on is the NASER project. And we're basically using some open source eye tracking. We're not inventing eye tracking, and there are lots of open source eye tracking projects out there that you can pick up tomorrow and build yourself an eye tracking device. But what we're trying to do is solve some very specific pro problems with eye tracking as, as it's used for people with extreme uh, neurological disorders like Lou Gehrig's disease or ALS. Um, uh, in, with ALS, your muscles slowly die and you slowly um, lose control of all of your voluntary muscle movements. And that poses very specific challenges for people using eye tracking. And so we really want to look at problems, the extreme problems when you can't move at all. Um, and we also want to be able to um, perhaps push the envelope a little bit in terms of interacting with other devices such as EEG. So we have a partnership with a software company in Toronto that makes music generation software, and we're going to do an off program, which means kind of like a guerrilla type of project, where we're going to um, have, have a bit of a, a space where uh, uh, Wave DNA, the software company's um, artists, are going to be making electronic music with loops created by people using the eye tracking device. So it's going to be, that, that'll be at the beginning of October. So I just want to leave you with this idea of rolling up your sleeves and making something. I think Carlos encouraged you this morning to get involved with wiring and try it. And it's a very exciting time in these types of technologies. Uh, very accessible and uh, easy to use and communities of people that are willing to help you with your projects. I talked about the Arduino and 3D printers. Um, there are lots of different platforms out there that you can play with. Find the one that you like. Making prototypes allows us to explore design ideas and concepts. So try something. You have an idea of what, what might work. You don't have to create a prototype that's the exact replica of, of your idea. Try, just try out some of your ideas. Uh, try making some, some aspect of your idea and see if it works. Uh, I mentioned the, um, did I mention the cocktail guest robot, that one? No? Oh, I didn't. Okay, sorry about that. Um, that's Ross and Steph. They were a team at our um, robotics hackathon, and actually, the, uh, I believe they were the, the winners of the design category. Uh, this is a robot that um, you would take with you to a cocktail party. Um, and, and so when we saw it, actually, uh, Steph would play. She's a violinist, and so she would play the violin. And the robot would react to the music that she was playing, either pleasurably or, or not. Or you could whisper in the robot's ear, and the robot would react uh, pleasurably or not. So 
Um, so, so it was sort of like a robotic cocktail guest. And what I didn't realize is Steph is actually in a cognitive science program. And what she's looking at is the cognitive issues that occur when you're in something like a cocktail party. And there's so much audio coming in and so many different channels. How do you focus on the one that you want to focus on? And so there was some real thinking behind some of what she was doing. Um, on the other side, there's, the, there's our, our public broadcaster. I did a workshop, a Makey Makey workshop for them, and what they were exploring was um, uh, physical interfaces to children's games that they already had on their website that, they, that normally you would play with a keyboard um, behind your desk, and they were inventing new types of interfaces to these games that they have, they've been playing with and inventing. So iterative conceptual design and prototyping can expose uh, social technical challenges such as those related to policy, ethics, privacy, and security. So beyond using prototyping from an engineering perspective to test features and functionality, use it to test what the implications are in the context within which your, your, your object is going to be working in. And this sort of thing is very obvious to artists and designers. Um, this is another team from our robotics hackathon, that's Laura and Carrie. Um, uh, they created a um, sex education robot for the blind, actually. So it was, uh, they described it as a uh, 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 erotic landscape that you could touch and would react to your touch so that you could use it in sex education for kids who are blind. So very, very interesting. Um, uh, robotic concept. And that's uh, Javed and Gabby, and they were my collaborators on one of our prosthetics workshops. Uh, Javed is very much the engineer and very focused on the circuits, the code, the design. And, and Gabby's the very, very much the social scientist. And his work is, is looking at how do you use DIY technologies and making to teach kids about social technical challenges. So it was a very interesting collaboration to watch unfold. And finally, collaborative making is a chance to unpack these complex problems and better understand the implications of technologies. And so that's just some more pictures from one of our prosthetics workshops. Um, uh, what was really interesting, that's PJ up there at the top, and they created visual feedback, I think as well for positioning of the hand, but, but PJ really wanted to um, get into prosthetics and treat them as beautiful design objects. He couldn't understand why getting your prosthetic wasn't as exciting as getting, for example, your brand new iPhone or some of your other beautifully designed and packaged products, that you should be as excited about that as you are about some of the other things that you buy and spend a lot of money on. Uh, the group down there created this harness that you could guide someone who was blind. It had vibrating motors around the waist so that if you couldn't see that somebody could guide you so that you could navigate spaces. Uh, and it has its own implications for who's leading who and who's in charge and, and, and that. So. And I, and I think that's it. I, I guess I have a little bit of time for questions. Uh, I'd love to hear from you. There's my contact information there. Um, drop me a line if, you're, uh, if you have any questions about uh, what you saw here. Um, if you'd like to know more, or if you, uh, there were sp specific references that I made that you missed, please don't be shy about uh, dropping me a line. And I guess I have a few minutes for questions. I don't see, there he is. <laughs> okay. Are there any questions? The chips themselves. Uh, well, the use of them or the augmented reality. I mean, the, the best thing I've seen with augmented reality, they created a virtual store for Converse in New York City. Yeah. Like you would go to a little park and there would be things you could buy. Yes. Do you see any future in those what you may call pop technologies with the, what you guys are really getting involved in? So, so, um, so some of the, the projects that I've seen uh, in the research context are like the overlaying and the layering of information in virtual reality. So 
uh, in particular in architecture and historical uh, spaces, so their layering of information. I mean, there are practical uses in engineering and construction in being able to layer, uh, you know, complex um, multidisciplinary drawings, for example, uh, that, that can come. I, so, it, so I think the, the challenges and the barriers are really integrating all of those types of information. Uh, we talked yesterday with one of the students here at the university actually about city information and the, the layering of city information. Um, you need that information though. One of the challenges in my research